Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel. And I'm Kate Humble and we're up at Wallaby Wood with the 26 Bennett Wallabies. Now I say 26, but those are the ones you can actually see. Yes, spring is in the air and they've started to breed and you can probably just make out some joeys in their pouches <laughs> down there. And we've got lots of other stories about the animals here at Longleat coming up on today's programme. We're off to Kenya where conservationists are battling to inoculate these endangered Grevy zebra against an outbreak of deadly anthrax. At Longleat, I'm going bananas with the boisterous factory and camels. No, don't, no, no, it's not for you. Just wait. And we'll see how staff keep the peace between these two deadly rivals. First, we're off to Africa to visit the Tusk Trust. Tusk is a charity dedicated to conserving the wildlife and habitats of Africa. They run 25 conservation projects in 15 countries. As a donor, Longleat Safari Park has enjoyed a close working relationship with the Trust in recent years. This collaboration means Tusk has invited Safari Park staff to develop their professional expertise by visiting the conservancies it supports in Kenya. This year, Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner has brought four Longleat keepers on the trip of a lifetime to the Lewa Conservancy. Ranging across 250 square kilometres of land on the slopes of Mount Kenya, Lewa is dedicated to preserving Africa's endangered wildlife. Many of the animals living at Lewa are under threat, but none are more endangered than the Grevy zebra. Recognisable by their thin stripes and large ears, Grevies used to be found across East Africa. But because of hunting and destruction of habitat, there are less than 2,500 left in the world. Of those precious few, about 450 live here at Lewa. This year, Kenya has been ravaged by a severe drought, which has affected the whole of East Africa. There's been no significant rainfall here for over nine months. Now, the dry conditions have brought on an urgent problem for Head of Security Richard Moller. There's been an outbreak of, of anthrax in an area 45 miles odd north of Lewa, a place called Ngarani. There's quite a good population of, of Grevy zebra there. The November rains failed totally in this area, and especially up north. Um, and, it, and it's these sort of extreme climatic conditions that, uh, that bring out these sort of diseases, and anthrax is one of them. Anthrax has hit the headlines in the West as a biological weapon, but in Africa, it occurs in its natural form. It's a bacteria that lives in the soil. It's rarely fatal to humans, but when it breaks out in hoofed mammals, it can quickly kill. We know of 66 deaths so far, and you know that's a, it, it's a pretty significant number of animals. The disease could easily spread to Lewa, so the park management decided to vaccinate as many of Lewa's grevies as possible. It's a massive job. You're talking of a, an operation that's cost about $120,000 um, to include uh, aerial darting from a helicopter. On Lewa, we're up to, a, I think it's 250 odd at the moment, out of a total of 400. And we've just got this one small group left to do. But if we, if we can do minimum 60%, then at least we're, we're hopefully ahead of the game. Bev Evans looks after zebra at Longleat, but hers are a subspecies called Grant zebra. She's come a long way to see grevies for the first time. Now she has the chance to help Richard complete this critical vaccination project. Normally we do dart in a pen, a quite a small pen, so it's reasonably easy um, to dart the animal and also to, to get the dart back. Um, but out here, it's, you know, they could go anywhere. Um, and, you know, it must be quite hard, A, to, to find out which animals you have already darted and also to get the animals. We've already got some rigged up uh, darts in here. Yep. Important that they're, they're all chilled. Mm -hmm. You know, we've still got quite a few, but I, I think probably best we rig up a, a couple more darts. Sure, OK. You've got two compartments. Right. Yep. Yeah. You compress this one with compressed air. Yep. 
the plan is that compressed air mm -hmm. pushes that plunger forward yeah. and then the, the, the drug or, or the vaccine in this case is then uh, administered to the animal. Yeah, sure. Right, Bev, I think we can pack up and, and head out. Over 250 animals have been darted so far and Richard is an old hand at the process. But still, it's not easy. Once you've darted one or two out of a group, the rest uh, obviously realise there's something amiss here and, and become a, a little bit more skitsy, and, and that's why we haven't done the whole population. With one-fifth of the world's grevies living at Lewa, it's vital for the future of the species that the vaccination programme works. We'll come back later to see how Bev and Richard get on. Back at Longleat, breeding programmes support endangered wild populations. One of the longest running of these is lion breeding. Kabir, the male Barbary lion, arrived at the park in 2005. He's one of less than 100 Barbary lions left in the world. Thankfully, he settled in quickly. He sired two female cubs. At first, he was a bit of a grumpy father. But now, the whole family are getting on splendidly together. There is one line at Longleat that Kabir will never meet. 12-year-old male Mafui. Male lions will not tolerate other males. And so Mafui and Kabir are deadly rivals. Though they share accommodation, the keepers must keep them apart. We're outside the lion enclosures with head of section Brian Kent and keeper Bob Trollope, and we've got quite a task on our hands, I gather, guys. We do. What have we got to do today? <laughs> well, we've got to put one pride in and let one pride out. OK, that sounds relatively simple. We've got one pride of lions <laughs> out and they've got to be in, and one pride of lions in and they've got to be out. But they're all in the same section. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so how on earth do we go about this? Well, we just go in there and drive one lot into a paddock. Right. Um, <laughs> Get them into the house and then let the other lot out. You, sound, you make it sound beautifully simple, <laughs> Bob, but I have a feeling that it might be a little bit more complicated. <laughs> While Ben and Brian head down to the lion house to meet Mafui, I'm off with Bob to meet Kabir, who's holding court in the lion enclosure. There he is, oh, there just he there. Is. Just there. Oh, hello to him. oh, he's looking so handsome. And there's his. And there's his pride. There. Look at them. How do the cubs react to being rounded up and, and moved into the house? They're absolutely brilliant. Um, you normally find that as soon as we go over and open the slide up, yeah. Kabir he's is there. Playing. Yeah, he's pretty good at that. Because it was hours before, wasn't it? It was hours, up. yeah. Um, He's a bit of a wuss now, and as soon as he sees the house is open, he wants to go in. Right. Um, and that well, triggers off. It's a very off, cold day, well, it's yeah. true. <laughs> that triggers off a response from the females, because they see him going in and think he's, they're going to miss out on something. Right. So they come in. Right. And obviously cubs don't want to be very far from mum, so they follow. So they follow in. Um, I mean, is it just n simply not possible to mix the two prides? No, um, it would be carnage. Really? Kabir would want to kill... Mifui. Right. And likewise, Mifui would want to kill Kabir. Presumably in here it's Mifui's pride, is it? Just the three of them, yeah. Now, Brian, I mean, just how important is this to keep the two males separate? <laughs> Whoa. Oops. What would happen if they saw one another, for example? I mean, if they could see each other through the caging, yeah. then we still have problems. They would still be going at each other through the caging. Really? They'd actually try and attack one they another, They would try would they? to get to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done is obviously... You've, oh, built, no. you've, you've put that whole partition, partition in, right. So they can't actually see at all. And is this so that in the winter time when it's a bit chilly like it is today, both prides can come in at night and, um, and you can house them in the same area and keep an eye on them? Yeah, basically that's what it was for. You don't really want to let the old ones out too long in the code. You know, we, we've got the ability to keep them in for as long as we want. Absolutely. Well, yeah, here he is, as you say, he's looking quite, <laughs> so he's quite, quite keen, keen to come in. 
He really is a magnificent looking male, isn't he? He is. Oh, here's the others coming in. Look. Here they come. <laughs> so, what's the next stage? Do we need to let Do Brian I'll just let Brian know. Home? Yeah. Okay. Line two, Brian. That sounds like Bob and, and Kate. Come in. Yeah, the lions are in the compound. Fantastic. OK, thank you. That's phase one successfully completed, but the keepers still have to coax Kabir and his pride into the lion house before Mafui is allowed out. At Pet's Corner, Darren Beasley and Joe Hawthorne look after some of the park's less terrifying residents, including over 40 tortoises. Now they've come to the Lewa Conservancy in Kenya, hoping to study tortoises in the wild. But Lewa's a big place, and tortoises can be hard to find. After days of searching, Darren and Joe have heard about a tortoise sighting, so they've come to investigate. We heard on the radio yeah. he might have found something for us. Joe and I have just got fever pitch excitement coming here because mm -hmm. we just heard on the old uh, walkie-talkies that English here might have found us a, uh, a tortoise. And this is a big place. You're looking for a, a needle in a haystack. And we would so love, you know, for, for many, many reasons to, to find a tortoise. And if it is a tortoise and it's the sort of tortoise we think it is, it's a big result all round. <laughs> Tortoises are shy, well camouflaged, and very difficult to spot. But one has recently been seen in this area. Surely it can't have gone far. Okay, where the guy is up there. All right. Hey, hey, there you got it, you got it. Hey, oh my lord! Yeah. Oh my goodness. Joe, we're gonna need a bigger set of scales. That is a beauty. God. That's a that is a leopard tortoise. Oh my goodness. Oh. Isn't she beautiful? Don't worry, I'll take oh, some pictures. Ah, well done. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Huge. Goodness gracious me. This is dream upon <laughs> dreams. This is exactly what we're looking for. It's called a leopard tortoise. We've got the, the, the little dots. As they get really, really old, some of these um, can live a uh, huge amount of years if they're not preyed on. Um, this can go just one colour brown, but can you see it's got the, the little dots in here, a bit like a, a, a leopard coat. The camouflage on these is absolutely incredible. In this grass, this colour, you know, this dry grass, you're not going to see them. Um, obviously, you know, when they need to get away, um, they need to hide away from predators, they've got the perfect, you know, camouflage shell there. The leopard tortoise is found in grassland right across Africa. Eating a diet of dry grass and the occasional fruit, they can weigh up to 35 kilograms and grow up to 700 millimetres across. OK, Joe. First one, goodness yeah. gracious, 550. Okay. Accurate uh, measurements will tell Darren more about how life in the wild affects uh, the condition of the tortoise. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to measure her V at the back. Okay. Um, to give us an idea. I know it is a girl. Yeah, I'm Ooh. doing in, in mil, so 100 mil. Okay. She's a big girl. There's no shell damage, probably because her size. But very, when they're very young. These are ideal prey animals. Every, everything eats them. Um, even hyena with their really strong jaws, they'll, they'll, they'll try and bite into them and bust these. That's perfect. And they're like tanks, aren't they? Yeah. Look, she's going to go through there. But she's got a lovely shell, really nice. It's not only a defence, but it's their solar panel as well. And in this really African, hot African heat, I mean, it's 100 degrees out here, it feels so warm. Um, she generates all her energy um, from eating her food and then absorbing the sunshine through here. So it's a defence and it's a very advanced solar panel, you know? See, there's no damage here. Um, we know with our tortoises, the boy tortoises can be really rough. When they're trying to chat up the girls, what they do is they come up and they, they bash them <coughs> and you get a lot of shell damage. Here, look, she can be lucky if she stumbles across another male tortoise once a year, <laughs> if she's lucky. Um, so, quite amazing. The last vital job is to get a good snap for Darren's extensive collection of tortoise photos. Rather bizarrely, whenever I travel anywhere in the world, if I happen to find tortoises, um, I use my foot as a scale measure because you end up with all these lovely photographs, um, tape measures and weights and things, but when you actually see the pictures back at home on the computer, it means nothing. My foot has stopped growing many years ago, so I always slip off a train. It's rather, rather sad for the poor wild tortoise, um, but it's a good measure. So you'll see most of my tortoise shots at home of wild tortoises have, uh, have got a foot, Darren's foot inside. 
Darren's special interest is how animals like this leopard tortoise fit into the overall ecosystem. It's really crucial that everybody in the world understands as well that we're in Kenya, elephants, rhino, all that stuff, but the crucial word we use these days is biodiversity. Uh, everybody plays a role out here. These guys will, will they'll make the tracks, they'll eat all the fallen fruit, they'll spread the seeds, you know. If you look after the little ones, the big ones follow suit. And it's crucial that, 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 that the whole scheme, the whole web of life is, is cared for. So you can go back and find some more nice yeah. things to munch and yeah. live a long life. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Really Absolutely You're really fantastic. Thank you. Really you made us both yeah. very happy. <laughs> Back at Longleat, Kabir and his pride are in the paddock, waiting to come into the lion house. Mafui and his pride are inside, waiting to be allowed out into the open. What do we do now? We have to do this strange juggling with these guys, don't we? <laughs> what we need to do is let Kabir and the others in. Right. Before we can let Mafui and the two girls out. OK, how do we do that? Well, if we go down here. Back, back down to this end. Um, Obviously, you've got that partition in, but presumably there's still a sense that they know one another is um They obviously is know each other's well, there. there. There they are, in fact. Which that's, that's, that's waiting to come in now. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Wait. Come on. Come on, then. Come on. Come on. Come on. Brian, how are we doing out there? Not too bad. Just waiting for one more at the moment. Oh, here he, here he comes. Two. Now, there should be one other female and the two young cubs. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. Have you got them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Shall we, um, do, you want to, do you want to pop the padlock? Shall uh, I put it back on? <laughs> Blimey! <laughs> These are absolutely beautiful little cubs. They're getting on really well, aren't they? They're they doing they, fine they now. look so fantastically oh, healthy. So you're happy that these guys are safely in now? That's it, they're safely locked in at the way. So Mafui is going to disappear down the back. We're not going to see him, and the next time he's going to appear is outside. Is that right? Should be straight out in the paddock. Okay. Presumably there's secret passageways built in here, are there? You've got a tunnel, what we got on the back, transit tunnel, <laughs> okay. that we can move any line past any other line. Without, without any without contact. Without any contact, even. that's what it's built for. Oh, there we go. So that's one of the girls that went first. That was Amy, now Amy. Lulu. And Mafui. And Mafui. After, so that's safely outside. Yep, they should be on their way. Here they are. Oh, look, here they come. Here it is. If you want to just push that shirt, Kate, then that's, um, that's oh, Amy for today. well, <laughs> Wow! Oh, yeah. I feel exhausted. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was a, quite a complicated and manoeuvre, just, isn't and it? And you do that every day, every basically. Day. Yep. Cool, <laughs> is all I can say. I'm not sure we were that helpful, but thank you both very, very much for allowing us to see them. It's always great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Back in Kenya, Bev Evans is helping Lewa's head of security, Richard Muller, with a critical vaccination program. They're inoculating the highly endangered Grevy zebra against an outbreak of deadly anthrax. So, Bev, this, this group up here, it's, the, it's our last group. We, we know it's the last group oh, right. um, be because it's a group that's got several folds. Oh, right, they right. don't move very far from this area, so we've purposely left this group till last. Yeah. Are you darting the poles as well? No, definitely not. Right. No, no, we don't want to to stress them out too much. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the just fully grown the animals. animals, yeah. Okay. Finding the group is one thing, but getting close to them is another. See, they already know it's. Yeah, they're getting they, nervous. They already know hey, what's up here now. The zebra group head into an area of scrub, making it more difficult for Richard to get a clean shot at them. Do you think that um, hit the spot? No. No, not at all. No, it was a clean mess. Yes. So, so what are we going to do now? Just reload and. Yeah, try again? We're, we're going to 
reload another dart mm -hmm. and try again. And is it going to be a little bit more difficult now? You've already yeah, it is. Once. It is. Yeah. But we've just got to keep on at it. You see, now we're just following up mm. behind and they, we're just, just pushing them like going. a herd of cows now. The zebra are now clearly avoiding the jeep. We're, we're in, it's certainly not thick bush, but a lot of these uh, whistling thorn here, the, if the dart just touches them, it will knock that rubber yep. cover off and, and then we lose the, the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So we just, we just stick with them. They're moving, hopefully they'll move into a slightly more open ground. Even someone as experienced as Richard can't force wild animals to cooperate but he'll keep trying for as long as it takes. As soon as you start to follow them in any way at all, now they realize things, are, things aren't right, and hence the frustration. They know something's amiss, and, and we'll struggle, but you know, if it doesn't work now, if we don't, if we don't get any now, you know, really, there's just this last group left. But you see now, you, you, you can hear the wind and, and what have you, it, it's, the, the, the odds are stacking against us a bit now. Um, but there, there's only one thing for it, and, and to keep plugging on. We'll come back later on to see if Richard and Bev can accomplish their mission. Back at Longleat, many of the animals are acclimatised to human beings and not shy at all. Some of them even come forward to be given their medicine. I think this might be what you call a crush of Bactria and camels. Hello, girls and boys. Hello. I'm up at the new area with keeper Kevin Nibbs, and um, they're all looking very keen, Kev. They um, are, they are. are they li they're not lining up for bananas? Believe it or not, they are. Really? They really are. They're that greedy. Um, <laughs> Do they? I didn't think that Bactria and camels ate bananas. Uh, Generally, no, they don't, no. But, but here they do. Okay. Um, only because we need to give them some medication. Right. Uh, we've got a few here that are quite arthritic. Um, they, they're getting on in years and they've had a, you know, the, the wet winters aren't very good for them. Right. Um, so they've got arthritis and what we're going to do is put some of this powder for uh, their arthritis in yep. a banana and then we'll just place it through there, into their mouth. And so it's, it's, it's basically like trying to persuade a child to take medicine. That exactly. You have to disguise it. Exactly, yeah. OK, yeah. so you've, you, it's like doing a cookery show, this, isn't it? You yeah. split this one open yeah. and you just put it's a scoop of this in. One scoop in there and then try and roll it around a bit. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's nicely banana. all mixed up with a banana. Yeah. OK. Crikey, this gives a new meaning to banana split, doesn't it? So have you, is this a sort of tried and tested method? Did you try it other ways and they just wouldn't take it? We, we've tried many ways. Um, this seems to be the most quickest and efficient method. Right. Um, we've tried it with um, their dry food. Yeah. Um, but you have to add water with it to make it all stick to the, the pellets and it, it, it takes longer. At right. At least this way, we're with them the least amount of time. And, and I suppose, as you say, you, you're absolutely sure that each one is getting the required dose. Exactly, yeah, exactly. OK, what do you, what do you think of that, Kev? Do you think that's going to do that's the trick? That's pretty good, that's pretty good. If we give that one to Babs, because she's pretty greedy, that'll go, go down in one, really. OK, should we, do we need to take all of them at once? Because I know they can get quite, quite sort of, well, on cue, pushy, can't they? <laughs> wait, just wait, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah, if, if we take them all together, um, and we can sort of give it to the ones that need it, and we've got a few left over for the camels that don't need it, but if they did need some medication in the future... Then, so this is, this is quite a good way of, of, of obviously keeping an eye on them, because I know with them, they're big animals. Yeah, um, yeah. They're, they're... Well, they, they could be quite dangerous, I suppose. Definitely, yeah. They, they've got a, a big kick on them, very big feet. Um, yeah. Very powerful kick. Um, they can bite and they can spit as well. And we've got a gate between us for, for our safety. Um, and yeah, we can get right up, right up close. They, when they open the mouth, we can even look at their tongues, make sure there's no injuries in the mouth or things like that. Make sure their teeth are there. Um, right. So it's, yeah, it's just a nice way to get close to them, but safely. But safely, right? I think that is all four banana splits done. Right, I've got my two. You've got your two. Yeah. So let's now go. The one we need is uh, Raisha <laughs> here, the, the big white one. The big she white needs, one. She needs two right. of those. Now, this is Raisha. Yeah, and Babs needs two as well. Now, uh, uh, so they have two each, do two they? Two each, yeah, and okay. we'll give the others some um, later go. on. No, don't, no, no, it's not for you. Just wait. <laughs> now, it looks like, um, hard to tell with all that slobber, you've got terrible table manners, but it looks like they haven't actually got teeth as such. 
Um, no, they've, they've got a hard palate on the top of their mouth, and right. that, um, below is the teeth. So they've got the teeth at the bottom. The bottom. So like a, is it like a sheep? They've got a sort of palate at the Very top, much, haven't yeah. they? Very much like that. Here you are. There's your other one. Ready? Mmm, yummy. Thanks, Kate. Not like she cares. It doesn't last long. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Long. There's obviously a very effective way of doing it. Now, yeah. Babs is the brown one here, one, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, Hello, Babs. Babs. Floppy humps. Now, and, and oi, oi, oi! This is the male, is That's that the right? Male, yep, yep. That's Just... a love bite. <laughs> I'm quite pleased. Um, I'm not getting any love from him. Just wait, no, 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 no. Babs, they. <laughs> <laughs> They're quite a challenge, <laughs> aren't they, Kev? It's, it's good fun. It's very good fun. They're great, great characters. They're all looking a little bit um, sort of post-winter. They do grow fantastic coats in the winter, don't they? Yeah, incredibly, yeah. I mean, the, the, the coats are really thick. It keeps them so warm as well. Um, they can live in temperatures down to minus 40 in the wild. Wow. Um, but here we don't get quite that cold, but we get the damp, and it's the damp that causes the arthritis with these. So the cold, they, they're more than able to cope with. As you say, yeah. it's just the sort of that slightly wet Wiltshire that, That's it, yep, yep. OK, well, they're all dosed up. Can we give some other, some yep, bananas okay, to the others so that we don't get attacked by them? Here we go. Right. Hello. Whose turn is it now? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kev, I hope the, the, um, the treatment does the trick and they're all scampering around when the spring weather comes. You've had yours, but you haven't. There you are. There's your nana. Thanks, Kev, very no much. Worries. Here you go. Mm. Oh, you see, you're nice and polite. Mm. Chucking your weight around. I'm out on the steam trains with railway manager John Hayton. Hi, John. Hello. So tell me a little bit about this steam train. It's actually named after you, isn't it? Oh, yes. Sir. This I is the John Hayton. <laughs> and how did that come about? Uh, well, uh, I'd been here 30 years and uh, came up for retirement. Uh, we had a, uh, a new steam local coming. Right. So I wanted to know what to, to name it. And uh, back came the reply, you. So there we go. Uh, it's I quite an honour to be bestowed on you. Yeah, it is really. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not many people have one on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many steam trains are there here at, at Longmead? Well, uh, just the one. Just the uh, one. I did have another one, but I sold that one. Right. This one. This is much bigger. We've got many, many people coming now. We need a much stronger local, which this is. Absolutely. And, and do you get out in it very often? Not as often as I'd like, no. No, uh, uh, for the chaps who drive it, they, they get all the pleasure. Yeah. I push all the paperwork about. <laughs> so today, coming out like this is a, a, is a, an extra pleasure for you it's to wait holiday. from the office. It's a holiday. <laughs> holiday. John, thank you very much. Don't go away. Here's what's still to come in today's programme. Can Bev and Richard get close enough to the Grevies to administer the vital vaccine? What? We go into the bush on the trail of two white rhino. And we catch up with the otter pups who've just learned how to swim. But first, Longleat and its animals have been here such a long time that they seem a part of the natural landscape. But in fact, much of the landscape isn't natural at all. Half Mile Lake, for instance, is entirely man-made. The first Marquis of Bath had the lake dug out in the valley 250 years ago, following the line of an existing stream, as estate manager Tim Moore explains. The name Longleat comes from the Long Leat, or stream, and you can see, looking up here, the stream that flows through the valley. And then this source of water, then over the centuries, uh, is used to create this fantastic chain of lakes running all the way down past the house and contributing to the setting of the house. Inspired by the formal gardens of the Palace of Versailles near Paris, the 17th century saw the water being channeled into decorative canals and fountains. It was that landscape which Capability Brown, England's most famous landscape gardener, transformed in the mid-18th century, as curator Kate Harris explains. Brown's big idea was to turn everything into a natural-looking landscape park. So 
when he came in the middle of the 18th century, he swept away all the formal gardens um, that were created by the first Viscount and maintained under the second Viscount and brought up to the fashionable Rococo taste. He swept that all away and we just have a pastoral little. That meant woods, rolling meadows and, of course, tranquil expanses of water. Capability Brown was a remarkable man and he did it with very simple techniques. He didn't have the ability to use anything mechanical. It's all done by hand. Uh, so it's digging it out, shifting each amount of uh, earth into a cart, uh, then taking it away to move it to a dam. Very, very labour intensive. There must have been hundreds of men employed. Phenomenal achievement. Most of the work was done by 1800, but following in Brown's footsteps 50 years later, England's second most famous landscaper arrived on the scene, Humphrey Repton. He regarded water as a very important part of the landscape. He writes of the appearance and glitter of water as being really important to the beauty of the scenery. Those are more or less his words in the Red Book. So it's a very, very important element. And he illustrates it in the Red Book with little yachts on it. It's what he calls a, a riant landscape, a jolly and peopled landscape that is appropriate to the house. This is Repton's famous Red Book, in which he set out his plans for Longleat. We'll sneak a peek inside later on. Back in Kenya, Bev Evans is helping Lewa's Richard Muller wrap up the final stage of a vital conservation operation. Anthrax has broken out 45 miles to the north of Lewa, killing 66 rare Grevy zebra. Lewa is home to about 450 grevies, a fifth of the world's population, so as many as possible must be inoculated before the disease arrives. This is the very last group, but so far, these zebra don't want to take their medicine. Do you think that um, hit the spot? No. No. No, it's a clean mess. Yes. Fortunately for Richard, the group has now moved into an open area. Finally, he should be able to get a clear shot. Because the wind is high, he needs a perfectly still target, but the zebras won't cooperate. Oh, I am going to lose it. The dart drops short again. With this wind, the rifle is only accurate to 40 metres. At last, one zebra comes into range. So were you happy with that shot? The objective here is, mm -hmm. is to get uh, uh, as many animals vaccinated as sure. possible. Uh, you know, really, you, you want it on the rump or the shoulder, and mm -hmm. that, that wasn't wasn't first prize, but it but was it's second been a prize. Job. Excellent. <laughs> After the drug has been delivered, the dart doesn't take long to fall out. One by one, the rest of Richard's darts find their mark. That group's finished now, so we're, we're basically draw a line under the, the lower phase anyway. It's been a massive undertaking to dart so many wild grevies, but it's vital for their survival as a species. We have to do something. An endangered animal, we, we, we can't sit back and, and not do anything. And the fact that we've, you know, we've done at least 60%, um, it, it's, a, it's a major step in the right direction. Yeah, I feel very privileged to be, you know, sat watching this as, as, as it happens and, you know, such a, such a big thing um, to do here at Lewa and such an important thing as well. At Longleat, Pets Corner is home to the park's smallest residents. These leaf-cutter ants may be tiny, but they're incredibly strong. Each ant is able to carry up to 10 times its own weight in leaf. That's the equivalent of a human carrying a small car. The ants harvest bits of leaf in one enclosure and then carry them down these clear plastic tubes all the way to their nest. Over time, the tubes get mucky, so I've come down to the hothouse to help keeper Rob Savin give them a clean. 
what we need to do, first of all, I, I'm putting these bits of tape and blue roll on the end because as we clean each section of it, yeah. we need to block off one end and the other end to make sure that make sure no ends if do it's it. busy. Luckily, that they're not too busy um, today, so uh, we're, we're very lucky and there's not too much going on, but okay. um, otherwise they'd be all over the place. Yeah, give it a good old shove, yep. And hopefully just push okay. that bit out of the end and that should clean the inside a little bit. In the wild, they go off to go and cut leaves for food, presumably. Yeah, they don't eat it directly. What they'll do is they'll cut the, they'll cut the leaf, the, the worker ants. There's, there's, there's ants, the main ones you will see are the worker ants. Right. Um, and that, their own job, is, only job really, is to cut and carry. Okay. And then what they'll do is they'll take it, eventually when they get it into the nest, they'll take it into smaller, a lot smaller worker ants, that, which will cut it up into like a mushy pulp. Right. And they'll feed it to a fungus. And this fungus basically has evolved to live with them for millions and millions of years. And it, it relies on them. Whatever they give it, it grows. And then the ants eat the fungus. That's right? amazing. Very intelligent, very advanced species of ants. That one's just in there. I need to get a bit of that off the outside later. Okay. And we'll swing this one up, which is connected to the other end. And we should have a full working unit again. But we can now feed them We're properly feed on them here, now. can we? If I just swing this cupboard open. Okay. Hopefully, I should have some stuff ready. And what I'd like you to do, this is a little bit of planting you can put in there. Okay. A bit so. of I'm just, just, if you pop them in the holes. They have got certain favourites as well. It sounds really strange. Even though they're not eating it themselves, they're really choosy. And one of their favourites is Rice Krispies. How bizarre. And I've got a funny feeling it's because it's quite light to carry and when it breaks down, in essence, it, it's fine for them. And if you just tip, just tip a bit tip of that on there, yeah. On there it's like that? Of, it's a little bit of flake maize and they'll carry that as well. Amazing bizarre. creatures. Oh, look, we can just begin to see the first ones coming up there to take the oats and uh, we'll enjoy your nice, new, clean runway, Ants. Good job done, Rob, Thank and you. fascinating. Thank you very much. All right. Last year, five long leak keepers came to Kenya to witness a remarkable conservation operation. Two white rhino were translocated from Lewa to Kijio, another reserve supported by Tusk 200 kilometers away, where rhino hadn't been seen for more than 20 years. The male and female were transported by road in separate crates. During the journey, they each knocked their horns off. Rhino horn is made of matted hair and the horns will grow back. But it was a tricky start for Kijio's new couple, who it's hoped will form the nucleus of a breeding herd. Now Deputy Head Warden Ian Turner and Joe Hawthorne from Pets Corner have come back to Kijio to see how the translocated rhinos are settling in. I can't actually wait to see them, and seeing them in their natural habitat has got to be better than anything else. But Ian and Joe will have to find the rhino first. To do that, they're being trained by guide Patrick Lengilili in rhino tracking techniques. Oh, yeah, here we go. Ah, oh. got some tracks here. Yeah, and it's, they are walking that way. Okay. You can tell because this is the front toe here. Uh -huh. See? Right. The front toe here. Yeah. So they should be now at least uh, right. down that way. Otherwise, sometimes also we can look for their droppings. Oh, yep. and there are some droppings as well there. All right. Yeah. yeah. If you're an experienced tracker like Patrick, it's amazing how much you can tell from a lump of dung. So how do we know, Patrick, whether yeah. this is white or black? Well, white or black. It's easy normally for the black one. Mm. There is lots of twigs because they eat leaves and trees and things okay. like that. So for these ones, you can tell that it's the white rhino because they're just not, grass. Yeah, yeah just yeah. grass. Ah, it's okay. not, nothing like twigs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Normally we start yeah. from their water point where mm -hmm. they drink the water. Oh, okay. So we start their tracking there and then mm. you can just follow from there. Right. Yeah. So and how and far could you be going? You know, how, how far would you be talking? Oh, you could be talking like even like uh, three, four kilometers. Oh, right. Yeah, three, four cool. kilometers around mm. the conservancy. And the other yeah. thing is what we can tell at moment yeah. is if you've got the large one, yeah. it's usually the females. Yeah. Because when the male does it, then exactly. he, he stamps his feet and that, spreads it like that's this. That's right. right. So I'm sure now if you just got to keep our eyes open. Just yeah, keep going. Keep going and <laughs> at least follow the trucks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And you lead on, mate. Yeah. yeah. You'll follow. Yeah, right. yeah. 
Rhino are most active at night, and as the day heats up, they'll find shade and rest. Then they will be even more hidden and even harder to locate. Um, obviously, Patrick knows his thing, and there's lots of signs that they've been around, so, um, you know, he seems confident, so... and he's the expert. <laughs> The team have already been out looking for over an hour, and the rhino have three and a half thousand acres of reserve to hide in. It could be a long, hot day for Ian and Joe. Back at Pet's Corner, Keeper Rob Savin is on to his next job of the day, at the otter enclosure. Rosie and Romeo recently had two little pups. Amazingly, otter pups are not born knowing how to swim. They have to learn. But not long ago, the pups plucked up their courage and took to the water for the first time. I've been eager to meet them, so I went down to help Rob give them a little treat. These are the new pups, are they, Rob? Yeah, these are the uh, pups of the Asian short clawed otters. We've got Rosie down here, it's mum, and down the bottom there is dad. <laughs> and very hard to tell apart of the is... pups because they're getting very close to the size of their parents. I now. can't get over how big they Growing are. Growing at a dramatic weight, this sort of thing is, uh, is helping. What's, what's you throwing there then? You've this got prawns, is just one of their absolute favourites. Presumably that's why yeah, they're so making all of this, all of this we'll noise. Just this out, yeah. <laughs> Is that, 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 that kind of squeaking that they were doing, was that, give us the prawns, stop pretty, talking? Pretty much, but they are one of the most, they're very vocal otters. Asian short clawed otters are one of the most vocal otters you, you get in the, in the world. So, um, so how old, just remind me how old the, the pups are now? About six, uh, six months now, yeah. And there's no, there's no problem with them kind of hanging around with mum and dad? For... Not at all. This is one of the, the few otter, otter types uh, in, in the world that will actually stay with their parents, and they can stay with their parents for a very long time. They're very family orientated. Um, most other otters are solitary, mm -hmm. and they they wander off, and, and that'd be that. And even the parents wouldn't stay together. But uh, no, they could go well beyond a year. Uh, I've known some groups um, numbering twelve, you know, parents, and then twelve little ones. Really. Uh, and that's even been known in the wild. So, so obviously they had um, two pups, but, ha but could, ha ha what's the maximum number they could give birth to? They, they generally say they can have between uh, one and seven, right. uh, but, but two, two, two or three is normal, very normal. So uh, we, were, we were glad, to be honest, we, were glad, we would have been glad to have one because it's the first time since the 70s we've had baby otters. Really? It's, here at, it's here at Longleat? Yeah. Every pair, we've had pairs that have got on. Mm -hmm. Everything's been perfect apart from the fact for some reason they just won't they, they won't breed. So will all four stay here? Is that that's that's them for good now? Do you think? Uh, pretty much. Um, it all depends really on what happens as to whether we have any more. I mean, obviously we've got a nice enclosure for them. I still think though there will be a limit to how many we will be able mm -hmm. to keep here. Um, but what you can always do sometimes is um, in the zoo community if there's if there's any. Um, Zoos, other zoos which are looking for um, male or female otters, mm -hmm. it's good to possibly share them if you do want to move them out at some point because it's, it's very good for genetic diversity. Of course, to, to, uh, to share uh, all the, the blood. If, if, yeah, and to uh, um, keep good bloodlines as well. So if we do get to a point where we do need to move any on, there's always going to be plenty of places that will have them. Have they got names yet? No. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> what we're hoping is going to happen is a local school is going to come in and name them for us. And uh, good idea. I hope they come up with some good names. <laughs> We've already thought of a few I'm sure. nicknames for them at the minute, to be honest. But, Presumably uh, they've, they've... Smelly's they, one of them. Sm right? I was going to say, it's a bit whiffy around <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> they're one of the smelliest animals you can get, I'm afraid. Really? Rob, but they're lovely, you. they're delightful. They are. They really are. And of course, we'll keep you updated on the progress of these two young pups. When Humphrey Repton arrived at Longleat 200 years ago, it was the age of the romantic poets. When William Wordsworth wandered lonely as a cloud and saw a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. 50 years earlier, in the 1750s, Capability Brown had swept away the formal gardens and now, as estate manager Tim Moore recounts, Repton wanted to add a more intimate touch. He wanted a landscape that was more romantic, uh, more there for pleasure. And he does, in some of his comments uh, about 
uh, others, and principally Brown, he's saying the Brown sort of landscape is practical. Where you have a building in a Brown land, in Brown's landscape, it's a cottage or a barn. It does something. He said, well, we shouldn't have that. We're, we've moved beyond that. Uh, my uh, clients demand not barns and cottages. They want beautiful things in the landscape. They want temples and uh, grottos and uh, buildings that reflect the romanticism of the countryside, not its utilitarian use. As well as being a gardener, Repton was also a skilled artist and used a famous red notebook to lay out his ideas. Archivist Kate Harris has brought it up from the library. It's basically a very, very grand sales pitch. Not all his suggestions were taken up. Many of them, are, in fact, would, we're grateful that they weren't taken up because he perhaps was fonder of a very domesticated landscape. But Repton's proposals for making the house more imposing by changing Half Mile Lake were acted upon. I think the most important change that Repton made to the water at Longleat must be the change to the Half Mile Island Lake, um, where he lowers the water level so that one can appreciate the drama of the house rising more dramatically above the lake. Um, and this illustration, illustration eight in the sequence in the Red Book, shows a before and after view with what he intends, shown underneath the flap with the tributary river, the appearance of a tributary river going towards the boathouse and the house rising dramatically above the water. I think the before and after is a very, very sophisticated sales pitch. The second Marquis agreed to pay nearly one and a half million pounds in today's money to create the view of the house we see today. What they were doing, I was spending money on navigators' work, which is basically to dig out what was the former portico pond, to increase the height of the house above the water, and also to give um, the effect of a natural conflux of two streams, what he calls it. So they created that, if you like, tribute tributary to the main area of the natural river as an explanation for why the lake is so very narrow up at the waterfall end and widens out to such an extent at the far end. Repton also tried to disguise the artifice behind the inverted commas natural river by creating an island. So what they did was take a great bite out of what's called Hazel Cops Mead um, and create the island where we now have the gorillas. 200 years later, the man-made lakes look as though they've been here forever. Just as the designers intended, estate manager Tim Moore finds them a great source of enjoyment. Looking back at the origins of the lakes here, and if you look at Capability Brown and then at Repton, they create water for pleasure. Whereas before, it would have been the Marquis of Bath and his family may be going out in a little skiff or a sailing boat for um, you know, their personal pleasure. So it's like the rest of Longleat, really. Lord Bath and his father, by opening it up to the public, has shared what was purely private family enjoyment with thousands of people. Probably had as much fun in the last five minutes as I have for quite some time. It's a long time since I fed the sea lions. Very long time. In Kenya, Ian Turner and Joe Hawthorne are out in the bush at Kijio Wildlife Reserve with guide Patrick Lengilili. They are on the trail of the two white rhino that arrived here a year ago. Tracks show that the rhino are in the area, but the team have searched for hours without a result. Then Patrick spots something. There you go. There you go. You see? All right, yeah. Yeah, just under there. Kisses. Under there. Whoa. See? Yeah, you see? Oh, my God. That's the female. Yeah, that's the male. Okay. 
Yeah, you can yeah. see the ears going, yeah, yeah, missing out from yeah, us now. Yeah, no, I've seen it. You've you got to imagine, you've got two big rhinos there. Yeah. And we still had Dr. to spot them. Yeah. yeah. This is camouflage. Yeah. Rhinos have very poor eyesight, but rely on their excellent hearing and yeah. sense of smell. Yeah. They'll be now they smelling. Smell. Smell us. So would they I smell us? They'd smell us really good from there? Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they would. I'm sure mm. they would yeah. smell us. So we better go and do some different okay. things. You're in charge. And then, yeah, they will be in charge. Patrick leads Ian and Joe downwind to a safe distance from the animals. Quite close, Patrick. Yeah, quite close. Yeah. If we can sit in the shade here. Yeah. That's cool. I'm quite surprised, Patrick, that we, we've managed to get so close to them. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They must be quite relaxed because they, they set me <coughs> down. So they're not frightened. They're not bothered. Yeah, they're, they're frightened. quite calm. No, they're not frightened. The ones at Longley, when we let them out in the morning, they graze all morning and get to midday and they settle down and sleep for a couple of hours. Mm. And at night time, or after that, they get back up and they graze again, yeah. ready to go at home. Yeah. They, these ones do the same? Same thing. They do the same thing. They lost both the horns, didn't they, last year, when you loaded them up into the bombers? They seem to be looking really nice now. Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. At, at least even if you look just skinly. They have at mm -hmm. least grown, yeah. so they're doing very well now. And the horn's hollow, yeah? No, 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 it's like your fingernail. Yeah. Ah, Carotid. OK, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Matted hair. Yeah. Right. Since their arrival, this pair have been inseparable. They're always together. When they lie down, they lie down together. They go drink water together, they graze together, so they always do everything together. They've settled in so well, it's hoped that in the future there will be baby rhinos at Kijio. But for Ian and Joe, tracking down these adults has been a huge treat. It's been a brilliant day. We weren't sure we were going to find the rhinos. There's never that, you know, uh, went to areas, found the tracks, followed the tracks, and then Patrick, old eagle eyes, he spotted them. I'm amazed at how close we've got. Um, I never realised for a minute, thought for a minute, that we would get so close. And it's amazing, you know, for, for the size of them, that they could be so camouflaged in an area like this. The Longley Keepers have now come to the end of their visit to Kenya. They've seen some of the most amazing wildlife on the planet. And for all of them, it's been an incredible experience. Really, really wonderful week. There's such a huge, wide variety of animals and plants here. Everything from the, the tiniest little bug, you know, to the elephants, rhino, as I say, giraffe. We even found leopard tortoise. I mean, we're in the savannah, you know, hundreds of square miles, and we find leopard tortoise. And to top it all, the people, the children, and, and, and all the Kenyans. Honestly, it's... I'm going to take this to my grave for me. It's been an amazing, amazing time. The team trained with Lewa's anti-poaching unit and experienced the sharp end of conservation in action. They can pay for looking after this stuff with their lives, you know? Stop! And when you see Michael come blasting around the side of a thorn bush, brandishing a rifle at you, um, it's pretty scary. And that's what these guys are paid to do, just to protect the wildlife and the game that's here. So. That's pretty special, spending time with those guys. Each of the team has developed their professional expertise and learned things they'll be able to use back home. What I'll be taking back with me, I think, is to never take for granted um, the animals that are out there. I think I'll definitely go back to work wiser now. I, I would say going back as a different man, um, but you're never too old to learn. Massive suck on him, look at him. He knows what's in there. Coming out here and, and seeing the exact habitat and learning a lot more about behaviours, you just feel you haven't learnt everything, you know, books can't tell you everything. We have to aim to get our animals looking as good as these guys. There's always room for improvement. I mean, you should go to work every day thinking how you can make your animal's life more comfortable and better. This gives you kind of a yardstick to, to aim for.
Chase and I have joined head of section Mark Ty down by the lake in the safari park to help feed the pinkback pelicans. Yep. Mark, can we literally just start throwing yes. some fish to yes, them? Yes, just grab yourself some fish. And, and they'll, they'll just catch them, will they? Yeah. We've got a pretty big mouth, so it's quite difficult to miss. <laughs> yeah. and the, the, the bell is almost like a net, isn't it? Well, that's all right, Kate. They, it, it does act like a net. What they, how they'd fish in the wild would be to surround a shoal of fish, right? Dive their head into the water, yeah. And they would just their pouch is extremely elastic, and it will stretch and allow itself to fill with fish and water. So if it's got all this water in it, doesn't that mean that they just sort of end up drinking half the sea or half the lake in this case? No, what they do is they pull their pouch against their neck right. and squeeze the water out the sides and just keep the fish in. So they sort of sieve the fish? Yeah, right? absolutely. And when they're fishing in shoals, will they work together as a team or do they, do they fish individually? Uh, the pinkbacks fish individually. Right. Uh, the whites will fish as a team. Yeah. Um, but the pinks are more of a solitary sort of indiv individual feeder. They're very agile, aren't they? They, they? really are. Mark, yeah. I'm amazed there's lots of different sizes of fish. I mean, is that the maximum sort of size, that, 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 that no, one there? No, absolutely not. These just happen to be sort of quite small. Right. Um, they could probably swallow a mackerel twice that size really? easily, yes. And how many, and, and what sort of appetite do they have? Would they eat a lot of these per day? Uh, no, they, for, for a large bird, they don't eat very much at all. Probably only about three quarters of a pound each, mm -hmm. right. which is not it's a not huge amount. It's not that much, amount. is it? No. no. Um, looking out at them, they're dispersing now. Come back and show off. Um, you've got some that have very distinctly brown feathers as opposed to the slightly beigey, pinky white feathers. Mm -hmm. um, are those the young ones? Yeah, there's three really brown ones and the, those were the three that we hand reared at the end of last year. So and any chance that there might be some more this year? Well, fingers crossed, we're hoping there will be. Oh, that would be fantastic if there were. Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. We'll finish off feeding the pelicans, but sadly that's all we've got time for on today's programme. Here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Romeo the otter has a problem in his mouth that could be life-threatening. He must see the vet, but he doesn't want to go. The rhinos like their mud nice and gloopy, but they don't have to worry about losing their wellies. Your boot. <laughs> and Kabir is raising hell over his cat flu injection, but the little cubs don't seem to mind. That's all coming up in the next Animal Park.